If you're new here, my name's Tamer and I'm a final year engineering student at the University of Waterloo. It's quite common for tech companies to ask tough and technical questions in their interviews, for example like Apple. So today we're going to go through these questions and try to answer them with the best of our ability. And joining me is my friend Telsin who's a former Apple intern. We'll be talking about these questions, a lot of them are from product design and mechanical engineering point of view, and you'll find timestamps for everything in the description. Alright, so the first question we'll be going through is one that has been asked in both of our interviews and it's pretty common. So we got this from Glassdoor. It's called how to reduce a cantilever beam's deflection. First we'll start off by just drawing that beam. And that cantilever beam where this represents the wall. And you'll have a force acting downwards on that beam. And there's a generic and there's a general deflection equation that uh, deflection is equal to FL cubed over 3EI. L being the length of that beam, uh, I being the second moment of area and uh, E being the uh, Young's modulus. Okay, and Young's modulus could represent the stiffness of the material that you're using to make this beam. And so if your goal is to reduce deflection as the question states, there's a couple things you can do. First, to reduce deflection, you need to obviously reduce the force or reduce that length. So these are the two things that you could do that will reduce deflection. And it's important to note that since the length is cubed, changing it will make a much bigger difference than it would be if you change the force, for example. And now look, we can also change the Young's modulus and the second moment of area. So to reduce deflection, we'd have to increase the Young's modulus or the stiffness of the material, so get a stiffer material in general, or increase the second moment of area. And there's an equation for second moment of area if you had a uh, square cross section of that beam. And that equation is bh cubed over 12. And again, so the, the height uh, is cubed, so changing that will make a much bigger difference than it would be if you change the base of that cross section. So, in order, so just to summarize to change the deflection, the two biggest things are uh, length and height since they're both cubed, but obviously changing the Young's modulus and changing the force and length will make a big difference as well. So that's the answer for the first question. I'll see we'll talk about the second question. So the second connection is um, looking at if you are in a boat with a uh, mass like a mass of a ball and you and right now the boat is floating in the water if you were to take that ball and throw it overboard off the boat and into the water and let's say the ball would sink mm -hmm. would completely submerge what would happen to the water level would it rise would it fall or would it stay the same so to answer this question the first thing you'd want to do is you want to look at a or you, you'd want to draw a diagram of your first scenario so you have yourself you have the ball and you have the boat the mass of the boat is given by this big M, and the mass of the ball is given by this little m, right? So in the very beginning, the volume that's being displaced here is the sum of the two masses, big M and the little m, divided by the density of the water because that's where the boat is lying on. And the second situation what happens is that you take this ball and you throw it overboard, so you have the second scenario where you have the mass of the person and the boat as big M separated from the from the little m, which is the mass of the ball. So the volume displaced here would be two separate terms. So you have the big M divided by the density of water, which is accounted for this, and then you have the little m divided by the mass of the ball, which is this, or the density of the ball, which is this. If you were to subtract these two scenarios together, um, you would end up getting something like this, where you have the displacement one minus the volume displaced in the second scenario is equal to the product of the little m of mass of the ball um, multiplied by the reciprocal to the density of water minus the density of the ball. And since the mass of the ball or the ball is completely submerged in the water, you know the density of the ball is actually greater than the density of water. And because that is true, that means this right hand side is positive and sorry, this left hand side is positive, which means the displacement, um, sorry, the volume dis displaced in scenario one is greater than the volume displaced in scenario two. If you were to break the volume down in terms of the product of area times the z length, then you have area times z1 is greater than area, area times z2. We're assuming that the area into the page is the same for both scenarios, and because they're the same, they can cancel out from both sides of the inequality, and you get z1 is greater than z2, which means that the volume or the water level actually falls. And that's how you answer the question. That's good. So that's a good way of answering mathematically. And you notice for both question one and question two, we drew it out. So during these interviews, you'll notice that 
uh, there's a lot of, you have a whiteboard and you end up drawing all this out and writing it on a whiteboard. So now we'll jump into the third question and it will be, if you shorten a spring, how will it affect its stiffness? So we have to look at the equation of spring. So the equation of a spring is F, F equals negative KX. And in this, uh, uh, when they talk about stiffness, when they talk about stiffness in this uh, question, they're referring to K. So if you're sure on a spring, what that means is X would go down. You'd reduce, basically reduce the X value. So in that case, we would isolate for K, which is the stiffness, which is what we're trying to sort of uh, figure out its effect. And we get K equals F over negative X. And just from this, we know if you reduce X, you would increase the stiffness. And that's, uh, that's basically how you'd answer that question. Reducing, uh, shortening a spring will cause an increase in stiffness. So that's how you answer this question. Now, Tosin will go over the next question and how he'll go about that. Mm -hmm. So next question is looking at comparing the stress-strain diagrams for the two metals of steel and aluminum. So the first thing you'd want to do is draw out your axes. So you have stress on the y-axis and engineering strain on the x-axis. Um, and starting off with aluminum in blue, the curve will look something like this. Um, and I'm just going to label aluminum first before I get into steel because it's important to label your stress strain curve during, during the interview. So there, the stress strain curve is essentially broken down into two main sections. You have your elastic region and then you have your plastic region. Your elastic region is where your stress and strain have a linear correlation. So they have linear correlation and the gradient of your elastic portion is your Young's modulus, which is given the, the symbol of E. At a certain point within the stress strain diagram, your material would go in from exhibiting elastic deformation to plastic deformation. The point at which that happens is called your yield point, which is somewhere over here. And your yield point is what separates your elastic and plastic deformations. So on the left hand side, you have elastic. On the right hand side, you have plastic. At the very end of your stress strain diagram, you have your fracture point, but right before your uh, material fractures, it goes to its maximum stress it can take, and that is, it's, that is its tensile strength or its ultimate tensile strength, the same thing. Right bet before the ultimate tensile strength, so basically in between the region of the yield point and the ultimate tensile strength, you have your material exhibiting strain hardening. And then after the ultimate tensile strength and before a fracture, you have your material exhibiting some phenomenon called necking. And that is it for aluminum. Looking at steel, steel basically goes to the exact same stages we just labeled here, except it is much, the elastic portion is much steeper than aluminum. And it's actually a stronger material overall. So it looks something like that. One big difference, one key difference between um, aluminum and steel is that steel exhibits something called yield point phenomenon, where you have two different yield points. And that's because of certain um, interstitial atoms within the um, microstructure of steel that allows for this to happen. So this is basically how you would answer this kind of question in an interview. So now jumping into the last question, how would the back of an iPhone be manufactured? It's important to break it down into three components, body, holes for the speaker, and shine at the back. So for the body, there's a bunch of processes you can do, uh, such as CNC machining, casting, or milling. Milling is more important at the camera because that requires more precision. Uh, for holes of the speaker, you can do things like CNC machining again, or drilling. And then for shine at the back, you can do things like uh, grinding it out through some chemicals that'll give it that sort of shine that Apple is known for, or uh, using an anodizing process to create like a, protect a protective layer at the back of the iPhone. So that's some of the ways uh, in general that you can manufacture the iPhone. Of course, there's a lot more that goes, uh, there's a lot more detail that goes into manufacturing the iPhone, but this is just sort of like a general rundown because mainly for these interview questions, you don't have like, you know, hours to discuss this. It's not like a big, big presentation, but you just want to see that you understand sort of the basic concepts of mechanical engineering and manufacturing. And so that's about it for this question. Does you want to talk about the next question? Sure. So the next question is talking about some differences between steel and aluminum. So if you had a steel part and aluminum part, how can you tell which is which? So um, the first thing you want to do is if you, you want to compare their um, mass, their volumes. If they had, let's say, that two parts are the same volume, but like the same size, then whichever one is heavier would be steel because steel has roughly three times the density of aluminum. Um, next thing you could do is you can compare their magnetism. So since steel is comprised of mainly iron and carbon as well as some other small atoms, 
The fact that it's comprised of iron means it can demonstrate ferromagnetism. So steel has a greater chance of being attracted to magnets compared to aluminum, which is a non-magnetic material. The second thing is, is that if you had the equipment, you can even burn the two samples and whichever one had a greater melting point would be steel because steel is, um, has a greater melting point than aluminum. What, else, what you could do as well is that you can compare their hardnesses. So if you were to take some sharp uh, instrument and kind of create an indent on the two samples, the one that would have a greater indent or way easier to scratch would be aluminum and the one that's less likely to scratch is steel. So those are some of the top ways you can compare the two samples. There are other ways too, but these are the top five or four you can mention in an interview. That's about it for the interview questions that we had. There's only seven that we went through. There's obviously a lot more. And if you're interested, let us know down in the comments and we'll be able to do a part two for this. But that's about it for this video. I hope, I hope this video brought you value. And if it did, please make sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Thank you.